Uh, good morning, everyone. And my name is Claire Baker, a convener of the Economy Fair Work Committee. So welcome to this morning's um, event as part of the Festival of Politics 2021 that we're doing in partnership with the Parliament's think tank, Scotland's Futures Forum. Uh, this morning's panel is titled How a Just Trans Sorry, How Will a Just Transition Affect Me? We are delighted that so many people have joined us online and there'll be an opportunity for me to take questions later in the session. Uh, we're also very pleased to offer BSL interpretation for this morning's event, and I look forward to your questions and comments. So this morning we're going to consider um, what is a just transition and how will it affect each of us from where we work to how much we earn, where we go on holiday and what we consume. How will Scotland's move to a net zero and globally competitive and sustainable economy affect you? And how will we avoid a repeat of the 1980s mass unemployment when market forces and a transition to deindustrialisation destroyed so many of our communities across Scotland? Uh, this panel aims to address these questions in the next 60 minutes or so, and I look forward to your involvement. We are delighted that you're able to join us and when it comes to the question part, if you can put your questions in the event chat function and introduce yourself and let me know where you're based today, um, I will then be able to take your questions. I'm very pleased to be joined by our three panellists this morning. Uh, Dr. Poonam Malik, who is an entrepreneur, academic, business strategy leader and an investor in innovation. And she is also head of investments at the University of Strathclyde. Uh, Professor Jim Ski, who is co-chair of the Working Group 3 of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and is also chair of the Just, Ca Just Transition Commission in Scotland. And Councillor Angus Miller, who is chair of Environment, Sustainability and Carbon Reduction Committee at Glasgow City Council. Now, as I said, there will be a chance for questions towards the uh, once the initial comments from we've heard initial comments from all our panelists. And if you would like to make a contribution, put it in the question and answer box. And if you give me your name and where you're based this morning, I'll get through as many as possible. However, I would like to begin by asking an initial question of each of our three panellists. So we are familiar with terms such as a green recovery and no one being left behind, and donut economics is now commonplace. But what exactly is a just transition. And I noticed this morning that the trade unions and the newspapers talking about the need for the government to take radical action on green job creation and raising concerns that um, that there is perhaps not enough detail on what a just transition actually means for Scotland. So if I can ask the panellists to give their definitions, and I'll come to Dr Malik first of all, then Professor Ski, then Councillor Miller. So Dr Malik. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. And good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, lovely Saturday morning, and I hope you are looking forward to this interesting discussion. Uh, as you said, Claire, um, yes, just transition and green recovery. We are all hearing about it, but uh, there is also a little bit uh, puzzle or lack of clarity sometimes in people's mind. And if we could just break it down simply into terminology, for example, so as I see it, eventually it's an outcome. We want to achieve it for the society, for the community, for the public and our citizens. But it's also a process about how we do it, how we achieve that end goal where a transition to net zero is just. And what, why, by that I mean that it's fair, it's inclusive, and it's taking people along on a journey where we achieve that target where our carbon emissions are net zero, but it's done in partnership, in collaboration by, with people, so that certain communities, certain marginalized societies, and businesses that have to make this change, this drastic change uh, in their processes, in their practices, is not uh, in sort of in an unjust way to certain people. They don't suffer, as you mentioned, um, industrialization or 1980s uh, time. Similarly, now there is a challenge about the energy sector or different sections of the society. And what we are wanting at this stage from the government point of view, from the business leaders and academia and politicians all come together 
to say let's plan this and obviously jim is going to come and talk about um, the wonderful commission and the plan report that is being there but i think the critical uh, point at this stage in everybody's mind is that how are we going to adopt it implement it and then monitor and say that the delivery was actually done towards that what was uh, said that we will do and i'm sure we'll talk more on this thank you very much dr malik um Better Ski, could you maybe respond to the question? I noticed that uh, Ross Boye, who is SQC General Secretary this morning, says that, that, as it stands, Scotland's not on track to achieve a just transition. I know you're chair of the commission, so do you want to talk a bit about how we do get on track? And thank yeah. You. yeah, yeah, and I think Poonam has actually set it up really nicely by talking about uh, both outcomes uh, you know, and the process. Uh, you, you know, so when we were doing the work of the Just Transition Commission, first of all, there is no widely agreed definition of just transition anywhere in the world. We've got principles, but we don't have a precise definition. But for us on the Commission, basically it was about, I mean, looking on the bright side as well, looking about the opportunities that come from moving to net zero by 2045. You know, net zero Scotland in 2045 is going to look a bit different from, from Scotland now, and it's about looking for the opportunities that come from that. But where there are burdens and there are costs to be borne, it's to make sure that these that these are distributed fairly, and it doesn't you know fall unfairly on particular groups of people depending on the kind of jobs they do or where they live or or the kind of lives they live. So the fairness thing is is right at the heart of it. And one other thing that I I, I would flag up. Uh, we particularly identify you. No society is perfect in terms of justice at the, 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 the moment, and there are injustices in Scotland already. Things like land tenure, fair work, which the STUC will be very concerned about, and energy poverty. And the just transition is an opportunity to deal with existing injustices as, as well as, as think about things in the future. If I might, just on the process side, I could quarrel a little with the, the with the title of the festival panel. Actually, how will a just transition affect me? Because it makes citizen sounds very pa passive, and uh, as though the just transition is something that's cooked up, uh, you know, in government offices in Edinburgh, and that should not be the case. That's exactly how a just transition shouldn't work. You know, it should, as Poonam says, involve engagement with people. And the Just Transition Commission made lots of recommendations about how to make this a properly bottom-up and owned process, not something that, that that's done top down. And you, you know, the STUC position, position uh, you know, you know, completely agree. We we are not on track at the moment, and that's why we need a Just Transition Minister, which we have now, and a Just Transition Commission to scrutinise what the Scottish Government does, just to make sure that we stay in the right direction. But it's at the start of a journey, and we have absolutely not ticked all the boxes on this yet. Freely admit that. Thank you. And um, Councillor Miller. Thanks very much. Um, I think in, in Scottish politics, uh, Often, uh, when we talk about just transition, people kind of assume that is a, a kind of byphrase for for the northeast of Scotland because of the particular challenges that we have there uh, around the oil and gas sector. And of course, that is uh, you know very much uh, a warranted focus uh, on that particular uh, industry. But just transition is something that you know uh, is applies to all of our communities in all parts of Scotland. Um, and you know, as a city councillor for, for for Glasgow, um, you know, is something that we are absolutely trying to put at the heart of the. Uh, the, the kind of the message and the, the plans that we have around the uh, the, the goals that, that we as a city have for for net zero. I think fundamentally it's about recognising the the link between social and climate justice and, and the fact that the, both of them go hand in hand, um, and that the in pursuit of net zero and, and in Glasgow our, our city target is for 2030. Um, we need to ensure that all of our communities um, are, are included in that and are, are actively engaged in that. One thing we often talk about in Glasgow is, um, uh, as a city council is the fact that it was in, in Glasgow Green that um, James Watt conceived the idea for a separate condenser for the, for the steam engine, which effectively revolutionised that technology and paved the way for the Industrial Revolution. And it's, it's kind of not lost on me that it's only just up uh, the Clyde, uh, you know, a few miles that, uh, you know, along at the SEC, um, that uh, delegates will be gathering to discuss the, the, the future of um, you know, climate action globally. 
Um, but of course, we know that that industrial revolution left um, a huge legacy, you know, a deeply damaging legacy for Glasgow, one that's been generational in terms of the, the impacts of poverty, inequality, health inequalities too. Um, and, and that's absolutely experienced the, an experience that we cannot afford to repeat. So, planning at this stage for that just transition um, and ensuring that all of the action that we take um, uh, on climate action is tailored both to uh, the, the communities that are um, least able to adapt, uh, you know, have the, have the least resources to make choices, for example, that, that we're requiring people to make in order to, um, in, in order to, to, to move to a more sustainable way of life. Um, and also including people um, and communities uh, within the design of those very um, th those very strategies, those very plans for net zero. Um, it's very important, I think, as, as Professor Ski said. Um, you know, it's it, it, it's incredibly important that um, it, it's not something that's done to people just transition. It needs to be something uh, that we're, we're giving people ownership over and communities ownership over. Um, and I think you know, cities and other local authorities and Scottish government uh, or, or or whatever bodies need to ensure. That they are actively co-designing and collaborating with communities and, and giving them that sense of, uh, of ownership over this whole agenda. Otherwise, it will become something that, um, unfortunately, is done to people uh, rather than with them. Okay, thank you. Um, I am happy to take questions now. If people want to put questions into the A, I can pick those up and put them to the panel. But I'll maybe start with was referring again to um, Angus's response. Angus represents Glasgow, and I represent. For Scotland and Fife. Uh, Fife is an area that had um, you know, huge deindustrialisation with the closure of the, the mines, and we had a history of mining villages in this area, where there are areas in Fife that are still living with the legacy and the social challenges that came along with the, the closures and the way in which that was managed. And Professor Ski, do you want to talk a wee bit about where, in terms of a just transition within Scotland, if, how, how do we prevent regional inequalities? Exacerbating and other areas. I know the North East already been mentioned. Other areas that are set to benefit, or how do we make sure that it is an equal transition? Yeah, and, and just to say, Claire, the very first meeting of the Just Transition Commission took, took place at the Caulfield Regeneration Trust in Concarden because we wanted to take a careful look backwards at how unjust transitions take place, and we we learned a lot, you, you know, from, from going to that meeting. Uh, so, so for me, that I mean, the three big ticket items. I mean, the trouble is, just transitions like the Heineken policy area it gets absolutely everywhere in, around the system. Uh, but just to you know, to give priorities, I mean, I think Angus has mentioned it already. The northeast is an issue because of the dependence on oil and gas there. So the, that that's one of the big challenges is the energy supply sector and where it goes and whether the jobs that have once been in oil and gas can move into other parts of the energy sector, particularly offshore renewables, but potentially also carbon capture and storage and hydrogen uh, you, you know, for the longer term. So these possibilities are there. And the first ever just transition plan, sectoral plan for Scotland will be in the energy sector because of the priority that's attached to that. But, but, but when we uh, you know, did, the, did the just transition report, we really wanted to expand the scope of it. So I think the, the, the other area is housing and buildings, actually, where there is a very, very big need. You know, Scotland's buildings rather are pretty leaky in terms of heat. And there's an awful lot that needs to be done in terms of improving buildings, insulating you know, the moving to heat pumps agenda, which, which is coming up as well. And that's a triple win area because you can get emissions down, you can address energy poverty, and you can create more skilled employment given the kind of you know the deeper changes that will be needed to housing. And then the other area I would actually pick out is, is rural areas. Uh, and, uh, and, and the highlands. Uh, we do need to look at the question of land use and agriculture, you know, which is important in Scotland as well. Recommendations are to plant more trees, but there's also issues around, uh, you know, protecting and getting recovery of peat bogs and things like that. So these will be important. Here. These would be the three big ticket items for me. There's more, but th these are the, the three easiest, I think, to get over quickly. Thank you. And um, Dr. Malik, do you have any uh, views on this in terms of any regional inequalities that you can see where the challenges that we have in Scotland will be? 
Thank you for uh, for that, uh, Claire. And I agree with the three areas that uh, Jim has picked up. And in that, if I could just add, uh, I would also say that while and we need to look out and look for the risks, it's also an opportunity because there are certain areas, for example, Scotland has a wealth of natural resources, and that is where we could look at it that certain regional areas which hadn't been looked at, so nature-based solutions, and they are going to emerge for that, and the areas that are rich in those, they will benefit. And in that case, what we need to look at it is also not a simply challenge or something to worry about. It is something to balance with what assets we have, make maximum utilization of it, showcasing it on the world stage, the innovation that we have. So that we look positively towards that and move forward to say what we can make better use of, what are our assets, and how do we attract uh, international investors, international funding into this area so that we can mitigate those risks and manage our uh, natural assets and solutions that are there. Uh, some of the areas where I see, uh, I know Jim mentioned housing. So that is a challenging area because uh, Scotland's target is if we are going to achieve net zero by 2045 at that rate, every three second a building and a house has to be um, as renovated to make, uh, and recently, just day before yesterday on the TV, the announcement was for the grants for heat pumps. Now that uh, a renovation of a house to move from the current system, it requires between 6,000 and 18,000. Now if I look for a particular sector, uh, retired people, uh, old people who are li living, would they really want to, at this stage, invest that much into renewing their, sort of renovating their house, somebody who's in their 80s and 90s, how long they are looking at? So that is the question to look at it. And um, thank you, uh, Dr. Miller. We had a little bit of problem with your connection there, but I think we heard uh, your contribution. Um, Councillor Miller, uh, you represent the Glasgow City, and you spoke a wee bit about um, the action that Glasgow has taken. What kind of communication and discussion are there between uh, local authorities? Is this mainly done through COSLA or? Is there a dialogue around how the different authorities will approach this, and is there cooperative working across the authorities? I think that's a very good question. Um, I think obviously there's there's discussion at kind of national level via COSLA in terms of the different uh, strands of action that local authorities you know can take and that are within local authorities' powers. Um, you know, so there there is kind of coordination at that level. I think the experience that we're having uh, in Glasgow, and one that I think is, is a fairly new experience over the last uh, kind of five, six, seven years or so, um, is really looking at a, a regional level approach to, to much of this. Um, you know, we as a city have fairly tightly drawn boundaries, um, you know, uh, for, for, for historic reasons. Uh, but we know that, I mean, we're, we're the centre of, of Scotland's only metropolitan region, you know, with, with 1.2 million people or something like that. The city of Glasgow itself only actually has, um, you know, 600 and odd thousand. So, you know, we know that we need to collaborate and we need to cooperate with other um, local authorities um, within our, our, our local area. So much of the action that's been taken um, is uh, at, at that level. Uh, we're currently developing a regional economic strategy leading on that for the, for the city region. Um, for example, which which will have just transition um, as a as a central theme. Um, so it's important that we have that buy-in and we have that cooperation. Um, but I think there's there's probably more that could be done um, to to foster um, collaboration and um, you know kind of sharing of best practice. It's something that we've tried to do internationally as well to to see how other cities and other you know areas um, across the world are responding to, to all of these challenges and. We're working to build relationships with, with cities that are going on the same kind of journey that we are. Um, but I think um, it, it would be interesting to see, um, you know, what, what the appetite is there for for kind of greater collaboration between different cities within Scotland, for example. We obviously have that through the Scottish Cities Alliance and other fora. Um, but I think there's I, I think there's potentially more that could be done as we as we start to get into the implementation phase. Thank you, thank you, Angus. Uh, we've had a question from Arlene, and Arlene is asking, she says, most governments' businesses are focusing on net zero targets, but should there be a higher focus on carbon negative targets? 
particularly in order to reduce emissions. Um, Professor Ski, can I ask you maybe to respond to that first? We've talked about Scotland has a target of 2045 for net zero, but should there be more of a focus on carbon negative targets? Well, 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 well just to say, I mean, there's life beyond 2045. We we, we all hope, at least for some of us. And uh, you, you know, the you know, the, by by the time you get to that point. Uh, you know, you may well be looking at uh, every country that's reached net zero moving on to get to negative emissions to compensate for other parts of the world, uh, you, you know, where, where there still be emissions in place. So just to say, even when you get to 20, 2045, there is still a need to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, because there are some sectors which will continue to emit greenhouse gases in 2045, and they need to be compensated for. Uh, by the removal of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So, looking at the Committee on Climate Change's guidance on what 2045 might look like in Scotland, and there's different different ways you can tell the story. There would still be emissions left from agriculture, mainly because of methane rather than carbon dioxide, which is also a greenhouse gas. And if people continue to fly, it's very difficult uh, you know, to, to to make uh, flying uh, carbon negative. And that would need to be compensated for by the kind of more nature-based solutions that Poonam was talking about, which in Scotland essentially would be planting trees and probably better management of peat bogs. That, that was what it would come down to. So that's what the picture would look like. So even before 2045, we need to start looking at carbon dioxide removal technologies, which might indeed be scaled up beyond 2045. Thank you. And so, Dr. Malik, in relation to that question, um, do you think that the net zero target is easier for people to understand what it is we're trying to achieve? But where does the carbon negative uh, agenda come into that? Uh, thank you, Claire, for that. And as uh, Jim said, that uh, hopefully what we are aiming for is life after 2045, where we have, if we have met our targets, we are net zero. But the population keep increasing and the new ways of evolving. 50 years ago, we wouldn't have thought, or 100 years ago, we wouldn't have thought that we will be in this situation. So we are preparing for what we know today. We don't know what is around the um, corner, uh, and environment is not within anybody's control. So humans and animals and living being on the planet do contribute to it, but then that's why it is called nature, because there are natural changes that can happen, and sometimes it is the result of human activity, and sometimes it is beyond our capacity. So it's the question of, as Jim was taking an example of nature-based solutions, but it is basically, it sets our target. So we are targeting for something that we know and wanting to balance, but it is to be ambitious and using science-based targets, so utilizing what is available, what is known to us, and monitoring at the same level, and probably not being as reckless as has happened, because sometimes we say that we are in this situation because we let we drop the ball. We let go, uh, we became ambitious with our growth, with our energy usage, uh, with our consumption. And if we become, I mean, taking the example of donut economy, we are talking of green recovery because we used too much of the planet. Something that wasn't ours to take, we took. So which is why at the same time, when we are moving towards 2045, and we are saying that let's make it neutral, but in what about offsetting something that we don't even know is happening or naturally changing, as Jim was talking about the methane production, or um, there are various other changes that might happen. So to balance those, we need to also have innovation going, which will be providing solution for that. But the science-based uh, methods that are monitoring, reporting, and changing, for that we need to set that ambition higher, so that we are definitely needing beyond that life, and not only making e zero. We I agree with Arlene that we need to be thinking about um, our uh, ambition for negative, so that we can offset for any unexpected changes. Thank you. And um, Councillor Miller, would you want to respond to Arlene's question? And also, I suppose you're in a situation because you're the elected member who's on the panel this morning, and every four or five years we all face election. How do you, do you have views on how you get some continuity and ongoing commitment, regardless of who's running an administration? 
Thanks. Um, yeah, so I, I suppose to to respond to the uh, to, to, to Arlene first of all, I think uh, I think it can be confusing for the public, and, and you know, following on from what Dr. Malik was saying, I think it can be confusing for the public when we're talking about net zero to actually communicate what that means uh, and, and and what we are actually looking to achieve. I, th I think the the question is a good one in the sense that you know perhaps it, it would be worthwhile for us to to stop talking solely about net zero and actually start seeing it as two sides of, of an equation. So one is reducing um, our our carbon emissions uh, and you know greenhouse gas emissions as far as possible. We know of course that there's always going to need to be um, some residual uh, emissions as, as as Jim had uh, outlined. Um, and then the other side of the equation is carbon uh, sequestration and, and, and capture and, and those nature-based solutions. And of, of course, when we talk about net zero, that's about balancing that equation. But there's there's nothing to to say that we can't go beyond that. Um, and of course, cities um, by by their very nature, by their by their density, are able and have been able to to move a little bit quicker than the, the country as a whole. And that's why cities like Glasgow and Edinburgh, for example, have 2030 targets because they are. You know the, the density of them allows them to, to move uh, at pace, and I think between 2006 and 2018, or, or, or something like that, in Glasgow, the um, the carbon emissions uh, uh, of the city um, have dropped um, by about 41%. Those are, of course, the the low hanging fruit, and and now we've got significantly harder work to do. But I think that shows the the kind of relative pace. So there's there's nothing to um, you know to stop us kind of continuing that journey and and, and continuing to to try and. Um, you know, promote that agenda beyond. I, I think, in, in terms of your question um, around kind of the continuity, I think the, one of the key things is just ensuring that there's kind of consensus and political leadership across the across the spectrum. I think historically, climate action until fairly recently was seen as the preserve of green parties globally. Um, you know, many different parties uh, from across political spectrum would, um, I think. You know, to be to be rather uncharitable, which would often pay lip service to it. But I think in the recent years we we've seen a real emerging consensus about the urgency um, and the, the the scale and pace of change that's required. Um, and I think continuing to develop that consensus will will allow us to you know ensure that there is continuity. You know, depending on you know regardless of of what political party is in power in any given level of government. Um, you know, and and I think it's worth saying that you know certainly in Glasgow. Our recent climate plan, for example, which which sets out how the city is wanting to to get to, to net zero by by 2030, um, you know, received unanimous um, you know, consensual support from across political parties represented in the council. So I think having that kind of political leadership um, and that consensus building is, is is very important. But obviously, that's sometimes uh, easier said than done. Uh, thank you, thank you, Angus. Uh, we have a question from uh, Gary, and Gary is asking what work. Has been done to assess the most vulnerable groups and communities who will be impacted by a transition to a net zero economy, and what can government, both at national and local level, do to incentivise community groups to create new assets like local energy hubs? And I can we go to Professor E first of all. And so, Professor, can you have to yeah, if you start. Sorry, your your microphone wasn't off at the start, Professor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I can see. I'm just being muted now. They weren't trying to censor me. Okay, right. Okay, so uh, you, you know, the, it was a really good point because it was a, it was a point we very much picked up. Uh, you know, on the Just Transition Commission. You know, phase phase one. Uh, but just to say, uh, the evidence that we had available for that work was very, very limited, and a lot of it was quite anecdotal. So we obviously know that people who complete depend on electricity rather than gas for heating are paying more at the moment. We're concerned about people in rural communities and the general question of income inequalities. So for that reason, one of the recommendations that we made to the Scottish Government that they have said they have accepted completely is that we need to do much better monitoring of the way in which the kind of climate change policies are affecting specific groups of groups of people. So we're looking at working with consumer agencies in Scotland to develop indicators that would help us understand better what the impact of policies are on particular groups. And not only to do that in the rear view mirror, but to so you anticipate when new policies are coming in that just transition principles and the question of equity, equities and fairness are built into the policies right from the beginning. Well, I can't claim that that's a problem that's being solved, 
but it's a really good question, and it's absolutely on the agenda for, for I think, for you know, for, for the new minister Richard Lockhead and uh, the Just Transition Commission as it goes into its next phase. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I'm, I'm afraid I seem to have lost Dr. Malik, but hopefully we'll have her back in the discussion soon. Um, so, uh, Councillor Miller, would you be able to respond to Gary's um, question? And I suppose it does I'm relate here. to things. Oh, are you still here, Dr. Malik? I'll come. I'll let uh, Angus answer first, and I'll come back to you. Um, yes, Angus, you talked earlier about the importance of community engagement and involvement. To respond to Gary's question, he's asking what can we do to incentivise community groups to create new assets and use local energy hubs as an example. But what can we do if we're trying to empower communities uh, to take action? How can we incentivise and support that? Thanks for that. I mean, I think um, I think one of the main things that we need to do is ensure that there's support for capacity building, um, and that we, you know, we ha we have the structures and the resources in place to actually allow communities to take to take ownership. I think and, and leadership. I think I think too often when we talk about community empowerment, um, you know, there's there's kind of just a sense of you know uh, communities being able to step in to um, you, you know to, to to move things forward, but of course, you need the the support structures in place and, and the resources in place to, to allow them to, um, you know, you know, to get going on that. So, um, I think resources is 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 the number one thing for me. Um, you know, often community empowerment. Um, you know, speaking from a local authority background, because we are the level of government that is is closest to um to communities. Um, in in a sense, um, it kind of falls on us. But obviously, we've you know, there, there are financial challenges that that affect all levels of government. So we really need national resource that's focused on building capacity within the communities, so that local organisations can um, can develop and and you know kind of grow iteratively. I think I mean one of the things is you know if if you were to take that proposition of you know to, to, to the city or to communities and say who wants to you know to, to start up a, an energy cooperative or, or or whatever, I think a lot of people um, you know would uh, you know kind of balk at the idea or they, they, they wouldn't see that as being a route for them because they would see it as being um, you know, challenging. They wouldn't know where to begin. So I suppose having community action and, and building capacity iteratively over time, so that groups are able to go in new directions and, and take on new projects and develop, I suppose, organically with the support of their local community, is absolutely key. But you need the kind of, you know, the seed funding there. You need the, the resources at the beginning to um, to support that, and then the capacity building resource to to help develop organisations and, and local communities um, through that journey. Hmm. And Dr. Malik, are you able to? Are you still in the discussion? Yes, I am here. Yeah, I think we do have a problem. Oh yeah, yeah. Can you hear um, me? Uh, I was going to ask if you could respond. Yes, I can hear you. If you could respond to Gary's question, and maybe also, you know, we are still living through a pandemic, and many communities are struggling with the effects of that, and most of our, I'd imagine, voluntary sector and community activity is still geared towards that. How do we support people in the um, just transition in the net zero journey when, at the moment, they're kind of overburdened by the impact of the pandemic? Um, yes, uh, thank you, Claire. If you can still hear me, okay. Then, as I would like to say, that uh, there is a lot of intelligence in saying that if we want to go uh, fast, we need to walk alone. If we want to go far, we need to go together. And that is the key here, uh, that as pandemic has shown, that unfortunately it was the marginalized societies, societies already living under the burden of low income, poverty, or diverse sector groups, that they have lost a lot of jobs, women, diverse ethnic minority groups, and it is not that anything is targeted, it just so happens to be. And similarly, that is exactly the point we need to look at it, that when we are expecting society or a community to make change into their habits, asking them, as Jim was talking about, the use electricity, which is expensive, and people have to make choices if they are earning uh, below a certain wage or even living wage, whether to eat, feed the children, or to use heat the houses. In that case, uh, what is the solution that we are offering if we are expecting our citizens and our communities to come along with that? So, for the, the government level, there has to be a policy in place, which is what we are here, that there is a framework and policy. But then, what grant support is available? 
what is message is communicated to the community so that they think that they are a party to it as as, as initially we started with him saying rather than being done to them are they feeling powered and wanting to change voluntarily but think that it's a choice that i can make as a citizen and i am part of that change because i'm contributing towards a bigger and a better world but where my voice is heard so in that engagement is required efforts from policymakers are required and then it's the question of uh, businesses to develop those innovative solutions which are not bank breaking which are not at the cost of eating food or heating the houses and in that case i would say education and communication working in partnership with the people and collaboration are the key point otherwise uh, change when it is done to people is never resulting in that so we have learned a lot from pandemic people already are feeling the brunt of it so that's why this uh, question of green recovery when we are talking about recovery that it is a healthy recovery for the society happy recovery for the society but the additional word green is because we are not going back to the usual good old ways and as we know fast food is cheaper as uh, there are cheaper flights but what is the result if we are trying to people to make choices where they go for a locally uh, made fruit food or a fly uh, or travel in the regional areas even with electric vehicles or uh, take uh, buses then we need to make sure that regionally those solutions are available somebody mm -hmm. means i know angus was talking about that glasgow and edinburgh can put faster targets because there is a better uh, transport system possibly there are more ports for electric vehicles what about people who are living far away want to make those choices but have no solutions available and that is where the responsibility of government and the community organization and councillors and business come to join together and provide that alternative so that people can make informed choices thank you dr malik um, i'm keen to receive other questions from the audience if you'd like to put them in the q a i'll put the questions to the panel um, but can i ask uh, angus earlier talked about political consensus um, and the comments there from uh, about the need for public engagement because you do need broad social consensus as well as the political census and you know i'm about to change to an electric car i don't expect to get a gold medal for doing that but i've been quite surprised at the amount of people who have said to me they've given me negative reasons about it making me actually think am i doing the right thing who are raising they, they haven't bought into it they're not convinced that that is the right way to go um now if they were arguing it's because i should be using public transport but they're actually arguing that i should be sticking to my petrol car and um, so how do we increase the public consensus and, and awareness of the personal impact as well as the impact we expect you know the differences we expect to come from corporations and from uh, government um, if i maybe go to professor um, ski first uh, as you're the chair of the justice transitions commission and how do we build a broad social consensus yeah and, and and just to say my sister's just brought an electric car car as well so so i i know people move over and it's very interesting that one of the more of the sort of social uh, science observations you know when you get a new trend like electric vehicles coming through society there are the early adopters who pick it up and demonstrate you know that there are advantages because you know an electric car you'll be cheaper to run initially it's obviously cost you money but uh, you know it's going to be cheaper to run and there are all sorts of other things like the acceleration on petrol on electric cars is rather nice as well if, if you're into the jeremy clarkson uh, you, you know bit, bit of the vehicle side and you know when early adopters pick it up and they talk to friends they talk to relatives they talk to colleagues i think it's when you spread these messages organically that it, you know, to, that it runs through and it will become increasingly difficult to acquire petrol driven vehicles and you know electric vehicles become the new normal by a social process rather than top down uh, you, you know I, I think it's important but on on the broader point on the just transition commission report we placed a huge amount of emphasis on the question of, of, of public public engagement and the fact that this is not a top down process it cannot be a top down process otherwise it won't have consent so we picked up on positive examples like the citizens assembly 
uh, you know, that was run and that reported about the same time as we did earlier this year. That was very positive. As people see climate change up close, as it were, it tends to get them engaged behind the topic and, and get there. So education and these processes will be important. And the other thing, just going back to the last question, it's not an area I'm ex expert in, so I'll confess that. But we placed a huge amount of emphasis on the question of local authorities and community level engagement because they're closer to people you know, than the national government in you know in Edinburgh or, or, or in Glasgow. So that that I think is really important. I just one thing to one thing in, in general to flag, and it's more about resourcing. If we compare ourselves in not only in Scotland but in the rest of the UK as well, with other parts of Europe, for example, local authorities here enjoy less autonomy than in many other parts of Europe. They're reliant on money coming down from the national level, and that has implications for you know cutting off resources, making things difficult. And I think, I mean, I hope this is music to Angus's ears, but we really need to pay a lot more attention, you know, to the financing at the local authority and community level, so that people have the autonomy and the ability to take action in in a in a positive and uh, constructive kind of way. Uh, thank you. Um, I'll come to Councillor Miller uh, next because uh, Gary's also asking about um, what are some of the examples of behavioural change, um, not technology, but individual change that need to be come from citizens. Um, I mean, I've mentioned electric cars, but you know, I, I recognise I'm in a position where I can afford to make that switch. That's not mm -hmm. the position that lots of people are in. Um, how do we? Where do you think behavioural change? Needs to happen. What are the challenges, I suppose, you see in Glasgow, and where do we need to shift people's behaviour? Yeah, I think the the discussion around electric cars is a is is a perfect one because, you know, even if we were um, to replace every um, car that runs on fossil fuels with uh, an electric vehicle, you know, that that would still be uh, you know a significant carbon outlay. Um, and and it would it still really wouldn't get us to where we need to be in terms of net zero. We need people to be you know, making fewer car journeys um, full stop. You know, moving to to cleaner technology is, of course, um, you know, uh, absolutely vital and and, and welcome. Um, but we need we need people to be pursuing um, active travel, and we need people to to have access to um, you know a, a affordable and, and good quality public transport, so that the way that people move around the city or, or move around the country um, can change as well. And of course, that is obviously I, I well appreciate that's a discussion that. Um, uh, you know, is 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 quite different in a city context than you know the more rural areas, and I think uh, Dr. Malik was 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 um, uh, reflecting uh, on the, the particular challenges um, you know around mobility in, in those areas, for example. But in a city like Glasgow, you know, we we, we need people to um, choosing new new modes of transport. So, you know, the, some of the things that that we need to do, obviously, to to, to get to that space is we need to make sure the infrastructure is there. We need to have active travel infrastructure. Um, you know, absolutely, and, and the Scottish government's investment uh, or, or commitment to invest um, in, in active travel is, is very welcome. That will enable us to, to encourage that behaviour change. But I think you do see this kind of chicken and egg situation where you know some people say, "Oh well, uh, I, you know, I, I, I can't, um, you know, I, I won't cycle because there's no there's no cycle lane to my area, for example." So actually putting in the infrastructure, it's kind of a build it and they will come type thing. Um, and, and we do know that in other in other countries that even before our kind of climate focus, but other countries which have shifted towards active travel, um, you know, uh, on the continent, for example, um, you know, they have seen uh, as they put in the infrastructure, they've seen you know massive up uptake in terms of people who are walking and cycling. So um, I, I suppose having that investment will be absolutely key. Um, and then the other thing that I think uh, Dr. Malik, um, you know, had, had touched on as well is is, is food, and you know, we we have. Um, we have food deserts within within Glasgow in many parts of Scotland where there simply aren't um, affordable, um, accessible options in terms of you know healthier and low carbon um, you know food. Um, so I suppose first of all mapping that to understand where you know where that exists, and then working to try and um, you, you know working to try and address that. There's some fantastic community projects in Glasgow and I'm sure elsewhere um, you know around the country. Uh, food pantries, which are are bringing affordable, healthy, um, and less carbon-intensive produce to um, areas, um, you know, that, that that require that kind of service. Ultimately, there needs to be a fundamental systems change, um, you know, with with food re retailers, 
um, you know, so that it's not essentially the third and charity sector that are filling um, a gap that exists. We need to, we need a fundamental change uh, in terms of how um, uh, you know the supply systems and 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 retailers work, um, so that they are really kind of embedding that kind of thinking, so that people have the the ability to make those choices um, and to and, and, and to embrace that behavioural change because we, we can't expect people to change their behaviour um, you know if it's if it's going to break the bank to do so um, and especially when we're talking about the you know the the, the legacy of inequalities um, you know that the, the, the just transition agenda is so focused on so yeah I think I think there's a number of things but the government really needs to um, at all levels needs to to make sure that we're um, we're empowering people that we're, we're putting in place the infrastructure, I suppose, uh, in whatever um, you know context that is, so that people actually have the ability to make those choices. Thank you, uh, Councillor Miller. Um, Dr. Malik, uh, Gary is asking. I think you dropped out for a little bit. So Gary is asking about behavioural change. What kind of do we need to see from people? He does point out that most of the UK's current net zero transition has been achieved through the use of new technologies. Um, and that's how we've made most of the progress so far. But when we get to the more or as challenging areas of individual behavioural change, and I wondered if the pandemic, because during the pandemic, you know, more people worked from home, there were fewer car journeys, uh, people weren't flying anywhere. Is there some behavioural change that has been forced through the pandemic that we should maybe actually try and hold on to? People were doing much more local shopping, you know, those type of examples. Um. Thank you for that, Claire. And I think it is a wonderful question from uh, Gary because that's the crux of uh, achieving any change. It's the people who make the change and not the technology or the meetings or uh, emails as has been said. So attitude change, I would say, is a marathon, not a sprint. And we cannot achieve it overnight. But if it is conveyed properly and people start to realize why that change is needed, that's when the wholehearted change happens. So you are uh, spot on in terms of that uh, the pandemic has shown us a mirror. It has, in a lot of ways, changed the society's habits. I suppose it was a forced change which we had to adopt. And in a way, what Gary is saying here is the technology, that we had to use technology uh, to connect back and uh, to deliver the solutions. But the byproduct of that or after effect of that was that the carbon usage went on. If we are looking at the Earth Overshoot uh, project numbers, then um, we have made progress by two months in terms of the carbon reduction in journeys and car travel and shopping habits and uh, local uh, supply chain, as you all pointed out. And the question then comes is that why do we need uh, to use the other way of life? And it's simply, there are basic factors to it. Sometimes um, it was cheaper. For example, for supply chains, we let it go. We just went for the simple options because the money was the priority. And then uh, we forgot to calculate what are the after effects of it? What are the side effects of uh, food or uh, clothing or an item traveling thousands of miles across? And it is with the education and the awareness that people start to realize that do I really need to look at that 50p? So which is why that carbon miles, if it starts to be printed onto the items, whether it's the food item or the clothing, then people will start to realizing like we are looking at cal calories now, do people need to be aware of how intensive, I mean, BBC has done some uh, interesting programs where they are showing that if um, people realize, then they make a different choice because it doesn't matter what you're choosing as long as it's affordable. So that's the question. And, uh, and what uh, so far one point that we haven't touched is the young people, because we have touched on that, that the elderly are affecting because there is a limited source income. Uh, they have what they have in pension or in the bank, so they have to make choices between what they food or heat. The, but the younger people, they are more aware in this uh, particular area, for example, and that's a good behavioral change because they have skipped a generation. They have not had those some of those habits which uh, we were utilizing uh, as a consumer. And they are making conscious choices, I suppose, for uh, certain travels or uh, the mode of travel, whether it's the cycling or the walking, they are more green aware. But what can we do to make them even more positive towards that rather than feeling that they need to drop certain habits? And in that case, the issue will come. 
how are we preparing them for these jobs that are required in future? And that's where uh, the skills uh, agenda will come in, preparation for the jobs and the options that are available. So if there are better solutions available, they will choose those better solutions. Similarly, Angus was talking about uh, the transport. Yes, transport can be challenges in the distant areas, in the re sort of regionally um, distant areas where there are no EV po electric points for people. To, yeah, you make an example of wanting to make a car, which is electric. But the question is, after 250 miles, you will have to be charging it. So if you do commute either for work or to go and meet people where you require that, then is that a, so for, there is a choice between a daily travel or a long travel, and then people make that choice as long as the country has enough. Similarly, uh, for uh, food choices, uh, uh, do we really need something off season? Can we not eat something? And, and coming from a society where food wastage is considered, I was born in India. And as you say, that uh, we always used to eat seasonal. We never sort of, it, do you really need to uh, preserve the food for, to eat it at a different time? Is there a shortage of food? So those mm -hmm. are the choice which we make. And pandemic has shown us in supply chain. Uh, that everything which we needed to travel thousands of miles just because we let go of our manufacturing facility. So from putting my investment hat uh, on there, I would say we need to really have a take a look of uh, what are we producing, our medicines, our life sciences equipment, our solutions are available. And those innovative solutions, we need to look at how we strengthen, do we have a plan B? And then when those solutions are available, behavior changes do happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Malik. Um, can I just ask Jim, um, the answer that Dr. Malik gave, she did mention young people and their futures. How does the, um, the Just Transition Commission look at issues of generations and you mentioned skills and you know, the new sectors that will be created that possibly we aren't even aware of yet. How do we make sure that young people and that generation get the full opportunities from this. Yeah, the Just Transition uh, Commission report uh, actually produced. Uh, we produced a green recovery report at the request of the government in uh, the uh, middle of, middle of last summer, and we identified a set of hot spots and areas where there were particular challenges uh, that were uh, created by that sort of wicked space between COVID, you know, get, getting the Just Transition agenda going, and young people were one of the hot spots basically that, that we recognised there. So we really did did pick out that challenge. I, th I think the, quest the question is going to be there, you know, do we get the right kind of skills training and education in from the beginning? And in our final report, uh, as well as sort of mid-career training from people who are going to need to change from one part of the energy sector to another, we were also very concerned to make sure that the skills and the education was built right in from early years to kind of prepare people, uh, you know, for the kind of labour markets that, uh, that, that, that would, would actually uh, be, be emerging. If I might say just on the COVID thing, just responding to Poonam, we've all been agreeing with each other so far. So maybe to, to introduce a little, little, little element, element of, of challenge on it. We found some difficulties with COVID there around the transport area because the use of private cars has bounced back, but the same has not happened for public transport. And that's a big challenge if you're thinking about ways of getting people to move around. So we were very concerned about rebuilding building trust in public transport. Especially given the fact that Scotland can actually build electric and uh, you know hydrogen fuel cell buses, we've got that local manufacturing uh, cap capability with Alexander Dennis. So I think that this question of public transport as well, we need to think very hard about the recovery from COVID because it has exacerbated existing inequalities rather than leaning against them, and that that I think is a real challenge for this. And I do yeah. think we'd be too real, realistic. So I've done my job. I've got it going because Pudam has got her hand up again for a, a rapid response. Uh, thank you, Professor Ski. Uh, we are running a bit short of time, so what I'm going to do, I have a final question from Duncan, which I'm going to pose to um, Angus. But Angus, if you can make any closing comments in response to the question as well, and then I will invite the other speakers to um, give a closing response um, as well. So um, the question well from Duncan is around local authorities, are they looking for uh, looking with energy companies on making green energies available, such as a hydrogen network. Is this anything that Glasgow's looking at? And if there's any other closing comments you would like to make, I'll take them. Just 
Thanks for that. Yeah, I mean, I think um, it is something that's very much on the agenda, and, and there, there are discussions, at, you know, certainly in Glasgow's context. I'm not, not sure how much I'm able to see, but there, there, there are discussions ongoing about, um, you know, about exactly this, and in terms of the, you know, the supply of, of hydrogen. We've, we've recently, um, you know, we've got um, uh, our, our uh, council fleet strategy. We've, you know, we've recently uh, invested in, in hydrogen refuse collection trucks, for example, and, and you know, there's, uh, you know, there's a discussion ongoing about that. But, um, you know, in terms of the actual supply of that and how we how we make that more widely available, that is something that that is actively being considered as part of, uh, you know, as part of, um, you know, that whole agenda. Um, I think the the, the final comments, um, I suppose that I would make, and, and just to touch on something that um, hasn't been. Um, uh, sorry, that that has just been uh, that I haven't had the opportunity to talk about, but um, just the the kind of skills agenda uh, in particular. I think um, it's absolutely key um, to, to you know to do anything we can to ensure that we've uh, the work working across uh, government, public, private sector, um, colleges, universities. Um, you know to to make sure that the skill system that we have is, is is fit for the changing economy. And I think that is going to be a real challenge. Um, we in Glasgow have got. Um, uh, we're developing a just transition skills action plan, and um, that's being kind of authored by uh, Professor Alan McGregor from Glasgow University, um, and uh, you know he's convening uh, all these different um, uh, stakeholders. But I think the challenge that we have is that the skills system is, um, you know, typified as as, as being quite um, supply led rather than demand led, and we you know we, we really need to um, I suppose re-engineer the entire way that we're doing it if we're actually going to. Um, you know, kind of get into a position where um, we don't have, um, you know, a skills gap and, uh, you know, uh, huge numbers of people unable to participate in the new economy. Um, so I think I think cities and uh, other local authorities need to be uh, need to be driving that agenda. Um, I think um, partnerships between different levels of government, as well as, um, you know, as well as the public, uh, sorry, as well as the private sector, um, will be absolutely key in that. Um, but I think that's the, you know, for me, that's one of the um, the key challenges that we have, uh, and one of the things that we need to get to grips with um, sooner rather than later, because it is, it's not going to come easy. Thank you, Councillor Miller. And I'll now go to Dr. Malik and then Professor Ski. Thank you, Claire, uh, for that. So, as I was saying, I agree totally with what Jim said, but I would also like to disagree that. Uh, Yes, um, COVID has shown us uh, that public trust has uh, become less in public transport, and whether that's because of health reasons that people are worried and they are not clear about the public transport safety. On the other hand, but I think the other aspect of that is that uh, certain um, vehicles uh, which are running on uh, traditional fuel tend to be much cheaper available options. So the question is that it is a question of a government working in partnership with the new um, modes of transport, which are available and accessible to people. And uh, we did discuss the hydrogen fleet and from Alexander Dennis that's available, it was run as a trial in Aberdeen. And Angus was talking about having that uh, possibly for Glasgow. A major uh, cities will be able to use it. What are we thinking about the regional transport areas? Otherwise, people will eventually make that choice that if there is no easily accessible transport, yes, I will choose my good old um, um, uh, car and uh, travel to either the station or the city and then go around. So in the, if we are expecting behavioral change, then we need to be providing alternatives uh, that are socially uh, just and adoptable for people and i think that would be the key for us in future because from the point the other point which we haven't discussed I, even though part of green recovery is utilizing 50 percent of the population is the women as i mentioned in the diverse group they were uh, the other unjust part of the um, society that suffered more than the regular and that is because of maybe the care responsibility but what we want to do in the green recovery and the uh, contribution to GDP is that we have seen entrepreneurs which have taken these challenges and started their businesses. What we need to enable these that to utilize the newer solutions, the innovative solutions, we bring them on board, whether it's through the, and I agree when Angus says that it has been supply led, but the, as a board member for Skills Development Scotland, putting another hat on, I would try to say, that what we are trying to say is that the universities and colleges work with uh, businesses to because for the green jobs 
there is no solution there there is no job there we have to create that so what do business need how can we work in together and that would be the future where we can utilize our assets but provide the solution in partnership with those who need it and that would be the real uh, green recovery yeah thank you for them. uh jen if i come to you for some closing comments uh, yeah, yeah. Just to say, we'll continue this uh, constructive de debate with Poonam later, later as well. So, so I, th I think we're going in broadly, the, broadly the same direction. Uh, but just to say, you know, the very word transition, you know, suggests change. It's, so it's really it's about a journey, and we're only really at the start of the journey on this. And there's an awful lot more to be done right across the spectrum. So I think the two things that I'd pick out is that one thing that's come out with some of the questions, we do need more analysis and understanding and science of certain aspects of it so that we can monitor progress and understand whether we're going in the right direction. And then the second big thing is engagement. And this theme has come through as well from everybody. This has got to be bottom up and it's got to be owned. Otherwise, it it will not not succeed. And just ju just a, a final kind of thing. I mean, so far I'm the only member of the Just Transition Commission uh, for the second phase. I hope by the time we get to COP26, I think in about ten days' time, I think we should be able in a position to announce a bit mo bit more detail about the direction and and how it will actually be taken forward. Because I might say, I mean, it, it's right that we should be very humble about our progress so far, because that's the way you drive it on. But people outside Scotland have been very impressed by what's going on. I have done so many talks in Brussels, virtually, other parts of Europe, North America, etc., about what's going on in Scotland. People are hugely interested. So we need to keep dug in. You know, we, we've made we, we've made a good start, but there's an awful long long way to go still. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, I need to bring it to a close now. I'd like to thank the audience for coming along. And sincere thanks to uh, Professor Ski and Dr Malik and Councillor Miller for their time this morning and their contributions to the debate. And also thanks to our BSL interpretation team of Helen Dunipass and Heather Graham. Thank you very much for your contribution this morning. Um, can I remind everyone that there's also other events this afternoon? Uh, our, well, our fast fashion event starts at 11.30 this morning. And later on, we have This Is Not A Drill uh, discussion on climate action. And it's an in conversation with the scientist, Dr. Suzanne Simard, at 7.30 tonight. And the festival runs on until Sunday evening. So thank you once again for taking part for a very interesting discussion this Saturday morning. And hope you will engage with the festival in the remaining days that we have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.